Our first speaker is uh, one of the finest fellows I know, and I'm so delighted that he's going to uh, to lead us off uh, today. Val Beasley is a professor of biosciences uh, here at Illinois. He's also the assistant department head uh, for his department, and he's also the director of the EnviroVet program in wildlife and ecosystem health, which is one of the most impressive in public engagement uh, efforts that I've ever heard of, and hopefully we'll have a chance to hear a little bit about that. Um, as part of EnviroVet, Vail trains uh, practicing veterinary, uh, veterinary veterinarians, uh, not just uh, in North America, but now um, in Asia uh, or in Africa. And uh, is, do you have some in Asia? Do you have a program? Yeah, we have, uh, we have the program is in the US and in Asia. From all over, okay. And, and to look at the uh, relationship between ecosystem health and new and emergent diseases in animals. Um, and it's a very exciting uh, effort. Um, he's also just, uh, he, besides just being brilliant, he's, he's a wonderful, sweet fellow. I, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing his talk and I hope you'll have a chance to get to talk with him tonight. Please join me in welcoming Val Beasley. I'll touch briefly now and then perhaps on some of the things that I've learned from EnviroVet over the years. Uh, I have the, the pleasure, I guess, of chairing this thing every year. We have a wonderful faculty. We have students from all over the world. And I do, uh, I do have the catbird seat. I get to sit there again and again and kind of take the course myself. Um, it's a free-ranging uh, endeavor, and it's a big picture thing. Uh, can you hear me in the back okay? I'll, okay, if you can't hear me, do something, let me know, because I may uh, start speaking Slurbian, as my wife likes to suggest. Um, so the wreck, the wreck, the wreck is not a simple wreck, it's a complex wreck. And so uh, these things, as you will see, uh, begin to challenge us to understand them and to anticipate them. But the solutions are not inordinately complex. But they are going to be challenging, I think, to all of us. Certainly not impossible. I think actually very doable. Uh, and I hope that uh, we go home with some ideas and some, some vision of where we might want to wind up. So, that's not going. Oh, I think I'm not on. Let's try this again. Here we go. Okay, so we have seen things happen, and I know others will be talking about disasters, um, but you know, here are a couple, and uh, are they divine punishment, as some have suggested? Are they just natural phenomena? Is this a relationship to where things were put in terms of planning? Uh, is it failed ecological services in terms of making our climate gentle, or in terms of preserving seagrasses or mangroves in these different areas? Is there evidence of failed intervention? Overall, I think we can look t toward the idea of poor ecological planning, implementation, monitoring, and refinement. Refinement of the way ecosystems are set out and managed. Um, so how might you work if, if you're in the in the religious community, if you were into resignation and abdication, I suspect you wouldn't be here. Um, will you work at your congregation, your community, your watershed, your ecosystem, your region, something larger? You know, I, I, I guess I was struck when I read the New Testament about Jesus and giving us data. You know, he walked on water. He raised the dead. He didn't have to do that Lazarus thing, but he did it. <laughs> and maybe, you know, maybe there's something going on in physics that will allow people to reach around the corner and see the deities at some point. And perhaps there won't be a division between science and faith at some point. There'll be more data. I don't know. I'm no expert in physics. 
But I want you to think about it. I'll maybe put your antennas up. There are serious Christian scholars talking about this sort of thing. And I think it might be something that down the line, someday people will reconcile. Who knows? Needless to say, I'm willing to be a little provocative and take a few chances of being called outlandish. And that's okay. I want us to all think. I want us to be immersed in this. And then as we decide what we're going to do, you know, we can be reactive, which we should be. We should react. We can be proactive. And what we rarely do is we scale our efforts to fit the scale of the problem, scale our efforts to, to the challenge at hand. So we're going to touch on the big drivers that undermine biodiversity and the things that increase disease, and oftentimes they're the same, and the things that contribute to conflict, and then look at a few of the tools that we have around these days to provoke responsible action. I'm normally talking to people like the biomedical folks and the ecological folks, but these other people have to be involved too. They really involve, they really are ecosystem managers, aren't they? they really make a decision on what goes on where. It's the everyday people and the power brokers. But you have a role to play. And really, you're at the tipping point. In, in the United States, the, the scale is tipped. The voters, because the religious community has come along, the, vote, the, the, the community really is ready to go on to stewardship. It's not a device, it's not so divided anymore about whether we should do something substantive about the environment. I think what's at issue now is what, when, and how. So are we a part of human, are, are humans a part of ecosystems? You know, we, we are. Whatever ecosystem we're talking about, whether this one, which has been inhabited for quite some time, or America, which has been inhabited for a lesser period of time, you know, what are we going to do about local and global ecosystems of the future? How can we plan, implement, study, and refine them? There needs to be a sense of urgency. The longer we wait, the more difficult it becomes, the less we have to work with. So what have ecosystems done for us? They have provided us with this wonderful soil. There's more organisms in soil than anywhere. And it's alive. It's, it's, it's what makes everything grow, and, and it has to be alive to continue to sustain itself. And the things that we've der derived from soil in other places that we use for pharmaceuticals, the lumber, the firewood, the rubber, the plants that we use for food and fiber, some of which we use in agriculture, the pollinators, the honey, and the game animals and the species that we've been able to domesticate, we've all taken them in from the wild. Of course, we know it regulates the climate, it filters and detoxifies the air and the water and the sediments. It sequesters toxic things like mercury. It has sequestered it in coal, but we're bringing it back up into our little thin, thinner than an eggshell biosphere. And they, it binds and detoxifies a host of man-made chemicals and natural toxins. And it, people don't really realize this next one very well, how ecosystems, historically and in the present, have limited exposure to microbes and other parasites. By competing with them for nutrients, by waging chemical warfare, that's where antibiotics are going in the soil, you know? A lot of things are doing that to one another. Taking them up and just tucking them away and not really suffering because there's not so many, or engulfing, ingesting, and digesting them, right? Or their vectors like mosquitoes and ticks and other arthropods. Right now we have a student on this campus who's been looking at mites that parasitize mosquito larvae. And they control and regulate mosquito populations. And herbicides knock out those mites. Even burning prairies seem to mess with those mites. And so when you start messing with these things that you don't even know are there, now you're, you're taking a chance. And how can we get back to where those things have a chance to rebound? Those natural things that we're controlling, those disease organisms and those disease vectors. And then there's the selective predation on the typhoid marys before they infect others. Even us, 